And again, I want to welcome everybody for logging on today. And my name is Julie Bates, and I'm the Donor Relations Manager for the International Elephant Foundation. Um, thanks again for coming on. And um, as we go through the uh, presentation this afternoon, well, it's afternoon where I am, um, if you have questions, uh, you may put those into the chat. And as we go through, we will um, answer the questions. And then towards the end, if we have time, we might have time for some live questions where you'll be able to unmute and ask a question directly. We'll um, kind of play that by ear and see if we have time. So in the meantime, um, once started, um, if everybody could please mute their microphones and actually turn off their cameras uh, while the presentation is going on to save bandwidth, um, because we have people that are logging on from all different parts of the world today. So um, that said, I would like to introduce a couple of people who are here on the line with us today. We have De Deborah or Olson, who is our executive director. And so she's on the line with us. And then also I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah Conley, who is our conservation coordinator. And she's gonna tell us a little bit more about what we're going to learn about today. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Julie. And thank you everyone for coming today and being patient with, with the Zoom platform. I know it's technology can be frustrating, but we really appreciate it. Um, today we are so, honored and proud to have a conservation partner here with you that can talk about forest elephants, uh, one of the newest recognized species of elephants. As we all grew up, there were African elephants and Asian elephants, or some people called them, you know, African elephants and Indian elephants. But it turns out that there is a distinct species of elephant that had been overlooked for eons, the African forest elephant. Um, so we have Christian Trier. So let me do a quick intro and then we will take it away. Christian is a co-founder and trustee of the African Forest Elephant Foundation, the only NGO whose sole mission is the protection of forest elephants in Central and West African rainforest habitat. He's trained as a lawyer in England. He worked at the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds in Cape Town and experienced firsthand how sustainable conservation work requires working with different stakeholders, governments, as well as wildlife. IEF has supported the African Forest Elephant Foundation and Christian's work directly, um, their work in Guinea since 2018. Uh, including equipping rangers to enable longer patrols and collaring elephants to monitor habitat use and to prevent human elephant conflict. So they're making some great progress in promoting coexistence and we are so happy to have Christian here today. Christian, would you yeah. like to take it away? <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks very much for the intro. And um, yeah, thanks very much for having me. And um inviting us to talk about forest elephants which um as you said have um, only very recently been recognized as a as a separate species um so yeah i'm uh as as sarah said i'm the co-founder and uh, trustee of the african forest elephant foundation um we are a charity registered in the united kingdom um and we we incorporated ourselves in, in 2016 because we um, and at the time, uh, they were, you know, after there was just African elephants being recognized as, as forest elephants and African bush elephants were, or savannah elephants were recognized as just one single species. Um, and we, we saw that forest elephants weren't getting the attention that, that they needed and, and deserved. Um, so we, we decided to set up the foundation to, to really highlight the, um, the decline, uh, toward extinction of the forest elephants, which were, much less known uh, because they didn't have the distinction. I mean, to, they were recognised as a as a sort of subspecies, um, but but not as their own species. So so we set up a foundation. It's very we're very small. We've got um, with two co-founders, three trustees, um, and we've got a fundraiser and someone helping with our uh, social media. So um, I think it's quite important for us that we don't receive any salaries. Um, so 100% of our, our funding um, goes to our projects apart from a few admin costs that we had to run our website and things like that. So um, and I like the fact that we're a very small team. 
because we can make uh, quite quick decisions and can be quite flexible, um, which is really important at the moment when it's very uncertain. So um, we've been supporting anti-poaching efforts, biomonitoring, uh, improving law enforcement, uh, infrastructure, and, and more recently, uh, research. So as we, as we were talking about um, the fact that forest elephants are separate species uh, since March 2021, um, even though uh, since 1900, uh, early 1900s, they were first, um, well, first recognized as a separate species by Machi, um, it was only in 2021, uh, almost 100 years later, that they were formally recognized as a separate species. Um, so I've just included a table there from um, from a, an article. Uh, it, uh, there are some later articles with perhaps more recent data, but this, this one provided quite a nice table to show the, the differences between the two species. Um, and I've included the photos there. You'll see that they've got, uh, I'm not sure how much of you are aware of, how many of you are aware of the differences, but um, it's always nice to, to remind ourselves they've got rounder ears, um, sort of down the point of uh, tusks. Um, they've got smoother skin. Uh, and then I think critically, it takes them uh, three times as long for the population to double. So poaching has a much more serious impact on, on, the, on the populations because it takes them so much longer to, to recover. And also um, there's a longer time between pregnancies with forest elephants. Um, and apart from these morphological differences, uh, I think more recently, which sort of convinced the IUCN to recognize them as separate species was the more genetic studies, because previously, uh, the fact that uh, forest elephants and savanna elephants could produce hybrids, um, you know, they, they didn't fall within the uh, strict definition of, of species because they could produce offspring. But then I think later genetic studies showed that um, the hybrids were actually unable to reproduce and then proving that they're two separate species. Um, so, yeah, the amazing thing, I mean, the more I read about forest elephants, uh, the more amazing they they are. Um, they have a really important ecological role, um, and they're, they're, they're lots of names have been given to them. Um, you know, gardeners and engineers of the forest are, are the the two most common used, uh, but they they really provide really important ecosystem services, which are actually vital for um, the whole globe, really. Um, so. I mean, obviously, they live in the forest. They're called forest elephants. Um, they, they, they've got a, their diet is um, is much more uh, towards fruit. So the, you know, the studies have shown that ninety the in their diet that there's ninety three percent of the dung uh, studied had uh, fruit in it. Um, there's trees that are specifically adapted to living with forest elephants. So there's a symbiosis where the seeds require. Uh, the digestive system of an elephant to to be able to uh, germinate, um, and the, the seeds are actually too big for other species to eat them. So there's many trees that rely on on these elephants to eat the seeds, and then obviously they transport them uh, great distances through the forest, um, which assists with with biodiversity. Um, and yeah, they, the recent studies have shown that they are the uh, species that eats most seeds and transports them over greater distances uh, than any other species. Um, so they're really, really important um, for, for, the, for maintaining the forest. Um, and also recently there's been studies showing their importance in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, a study showed that there was up to 7% more above mass, uh, above ground biomass of trees in areas where there were healthy forest populations compared to uh, less, uh, well, uh, less forest elephants. So, um, with, and, and then other studies from the IMF have shown that um, if you take, if you can, if you look at the value that forest elephants give to above ground biomass in terms of carbon credits uh, throughout their lifespan, they can be worth at the moment. Uh, at the time of the study, I think it's one point seven five million dollars, um, and now they're valued at around five million, which is quite incredible. Um, 
and they also create uh, forest parts which allow other animals to uh, to use and, and forest clearings uh, which they go to to um, get salt from the ground because they don't get enough salt from their diet normally so they with, without forest elephants the, the the congo basin would would eventually uh, well be less efficient and, and we would all suffer that's uh, known as one of the lungs of Africa, of the, of the planet. So, so um, I was just going to go through um, our projects just briefly and then focus on, on our recent project with the International Elephant Foundation in Guinea. Um, so we, we really focus on, on three areas uh, so far, but we are looking to expand. Um, Zanga Zanga in Central African Republic, which is one of the most important areas in terms of uh, forest and conservation, uh, Central African Republic, Gabon, and Congo have the, uh, I think, over 95% of the forest elephant population. So it's kind of the forefront of, of forest elephant conservation. Um, and it's co managed by WWF and the local uh, Zanga Zanga uh, protected area. And uh, yeah, we, this was where we started with our first uh, first project in 2017. We provided boots and socks for the rangers, um, and then we we were lucky enough to get some Toyota Land Cruisers uh, to help with the ranger deployment there. Um, and then we've uh, recently, with just they're being delivered as we speak, uh, tents, camera traps, GPS units, VHF radios, and, and compasses. Um, and yeah, now we're looking at it we're fundraising currently to um, improve their river patrol so we're looking to purchase a boat because I think they want to use the waterways uh, to get into areas where uh, rangers can't get to on foot because it's really tough tough conditions um, so yeah here's, uh, here's an example of, of one of the Toyotas being used uh, in really difficult conditions and I think Toyota is probably one of the only vehicles that that is able to to deal with this terrain, and um, I'm based in Gibraltar, which is uh, happens to be where most of the Toyotas are are deployed around the world for uh, NGOs. Uh, so that was quite useful. Um, and here's here's one of the vehicles that we're really proud to to provide uh, to them. We've also been uh, supporting the Homo Forest Reserve in Nigeria. Which is it's only a three-hour drive from from Lagos, and um, even well, many Nigerians uh, didn't even realise there were forest elephants here. But there's so, uh, up to about eighty forest elephants living in this, in this reserve, um, and there's only about ten rangers protecting them. And one of the biggest issues here is that there's up to twenty thousand uh, cocoa farms that are living and farming in the reserve so that's really increasing the pressure on on the forest elephants and a few years back there was um you know i think they were under such stress that they they all most of them left the reserve uh and then a breakaway population now actually found a new area which is in an unprotected swampland um but the majority of it remains so what we've been trying to do is improve the infrastructure in the reserve we've uh, provided funds for uh, constructing Ranger posts around the perimeter, so that people going in and out of the reserve know that they're going in and out of the reserve. Um, we've also provided the, the rangers with boots, socks, backpacks, flashlights, tents, GPS units, camera traps, and also provided salaries during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic because a lot of funding dried up. So uh, that was the flexibility I was talking about. We were able to quickly divert some funds towards uh, providing salaries for the rangers. Uh, so there's one of the ranger posts um, that's constructed. Um, and then with with our partners here today, International Foundation, who have been uh, supporting uh, our project in the Ziama Forest in, in the Republic of Guinea. Um, so we started off with uh, boots, socks, and backpacks uh, and flashlights, which you can see uh, in the photos there. That was our, during our first visit. Um, uh, and then we, we, and then in 2019, we um, we provided. We we realised that the rangers weren't able to uh, go deep enough into the forest um, on their patrols, and they were limited to sort of going three hours in, three hours out. So we discussed with them what they needed, and and we realised that uh, by giving them tents, uh, they'd be able to 
do multi-day patrols by camping out in the forest. And um, and also uh, GPS units were important for them because, uh, as you can imagine, you can get very easy to get lost in the in the in the thick forest habitat. So um, with the GPS units, at least they can do more efficient patrols. Uh, and also you can you know like now you can save important data like any anti any poaching activity that you come across or forest elephant sightings or even if it's elephant poop, you can record it um, and then everyone has access to that information. Um, and then the camera traps also really important because uh, because forest elephants are so elusive, uh, one of the only ways to monitor them and estimate numbers uh, was was by analysing uh, the dung. So um, by providing camera traps, uh, this adds another element to estimating the population by uh, by you know at least you can identify individuals. Uh, animals and, and, and try and come up with a number there and also leave camera traps in areas where you wouldn't necessarily patrol as as frequently. Um, and then, yeah, we were a bit quiet during COVID, uh, and, but then you know, the operations on the ground continued. And then um, in 2022, we were very pleased that the International Foundation provided funding towards um, our project to collar two forest elephants in Guinea and Liberia, which was actually the first time forest elephants have ever been collared in this area. And uh, so I thought I'd just go a bit more into into that. Um, we uh, so we went. Uh, I was lucky enough to go myself as well. Uh, so I flew into to Guinea in uh, in June. Uh, before that, the rangers had been monitoring uh, the forest elephants in the area to see what candidates would be would be suitable to receive the collars and uh, there were about three candidates in the end we had the two forest elephant brothers who um, whose mother had sadly been poached a few years back and they're, they're quite an habituated uh, pair and they generally were together they there was a few years ago they traveled uh, across the border into Liberia and then traveled all the way to the Ivory Coast, um, and they were sort of susceptible to human elephant conflict. So we decided they were good candidates to to receive the first collars. Uh, we had to get permission from the um, environmental ministry in Guinea, um, and on arrival we went to meet them and, and uh, told them what we were going to be doing. And uh, very, everyone was very excited. Um, and then we had a two day. It's a two day, two or three day drive up to uh, Ziama, which is sort of right on the edge of the of the Ziama forest. And here, here you can see a small village, which is actually just on the borders with with the forest. So you can see, and uh, just on the right, you can see uh, the road that goes right through the the protected area. So um, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the surrounding areas of of the Ziama forest, that I like this one. You can see in the photo at the moment, where uh, you know local lo the local community they heavily heavily rely on on uh, extracting resources from the forest and farming. So there's a lot of rice being grown in the area and pineapples, um, and now they're starting to to grow palm. Um, so here's one of the uh, local farmers that that we met, um, and yeah, unfortunately there's there's not very much regulation outside of the protected area so um, many local farmers will just decide okay well I like this plot of land I'm going to farm here um, and they kind of slash and burn the forest so you get these sort of this primary forest within the protected area and you get secondary forest and then a lot of farmland and um, what happens is the forest elephants come out and, and eat the crops and, and this is obviously the livelihoods of the local community, so um, if if the forest elephants are taking away their, their livelihood, then this causes uh, animosity, and um, some of the community members get quite scared of the elephants. So, um, so no, it's interesting to meet them and, and hear their views on them, uh, and definitely a lot of respect there, but also a lot of fear. And um, so, yeah, a lot of the time that we were looking for, for the for tracking the elephants was was in these kind of secondary forest areas. We um, 
we we contracted the services of uh, Dr. Pete Morkel. Uh, he's um, he's got huge experience uh, coloring forest elephants. I think he's done the most out of any vet. Um, and he's um, so he came with us, met met him in Conakry, and uh, here he is on the right, um, having a, a, pr a training session or a workshop with the rangers, explaining, showing them videos about. How how the elephants are coloured, what to expect, uh, you know, going through the safety protocols because there's a lot of things uh, to, to to think about, um, you know, especially once when you're tracking the elephants through the thick forest, uh, you know, if you if they charge, you haven't got you haven't got uh, much time or, or space to run. So um, he was explaining that it's a very small group, uh, maybe two or three trackers that go with with the vet uh, to actually shoot the dart. Um, and so, yeah, we made sure that everyone was, was on the same page before before we went in. So we had a few days uh, before we actually started the, the collaring. And um, on the bottom left there, you can see one of the collars. Uh, so Pete picked them up from South Africa, from African Wildlife Tracking. Um, and the first thing you need to do is, after taking them on the planes, Put them in a uh, in an open space so that they can get the GPS signal because after being having been on a plane traveling, they would have lost the signal. And this could, this actually took a few days. Um, and if anything goes wrong, um, there's not much you can do because they're in a sealed uh, box. So if anything goes wrong, really that's game over, and you're going to have to get new collars. So it's quite a hair-raising moment, and it's a relief when you when you get the first uh, satellite pings. Um, the other weird looking box to the right is um, basically because uh, of the thick forest that the forest elephants live, you want to make sure that the um, the actual transmitter is on the top of the elephant's neck. So we created these lead weights which um, from old car batteries and things like that. Um, so that that is... You know, Connected to the bottom of the, uh, it's a counterbalance counterweight that keeps the uh, the top of the uh, the collar, uh, so they can get the best signal. And then um, we once it, you know the, the rangers have been monitoring the forest elephants beforehand, so so that we could be as efficient as possible and not waste any time with the vet because we had the vet for about two weeks, so we knew that we had to get it done within that period. Um, and get the collars transmitting. So once we knew the collars were working, we had the weights ready, uh, we knew more or less where the forest elephants were, then we would drive as close as we could and then start walking through the forest. Um, here's one of the rangers carrying the uh, the collar. And you've got to have everything ready uh, once, once you find them. Uh, and there on the bottom right, we were you know, using the drone as well to try and try and locate uh, the elephants in the area. So here's uh, we asked uh, Pete if he could wear the GoPro so that he could um, we could get some nice footage. Um, once uh, once he's seen the uh, the elephant with his own eyes, then he can determine the amount of um, of tranquilizer that that he uses. Um, so that's obviously comes with a lot of experience. So um, and then obviously he's got to get as close as possible and have a have a clean shot um, to the elephant, and uh, you know it takes a few minutes for the for the drug to start working. So that's really the crucial the crucial time because um, if the elephant the elephant will in, inevitably run, uh, that's why it's really important to have good trackers uh, with you because when the elephant runs. Um, you know, you've got to be able to find it because there's a danger that if the elephant falls badly or falls into water or something like that, it could be very dangerous for the elephant's life. So we really need to make sure that the elephants are safe. Uh, the last thing you want to do is is end up accidentally killing a critically endangered species. So so the vet was very, very, very careful um, and making sure that all this, everything that we could do to make sure the elephant was safe uh, was done. So. Here you can see him uh, taking taking the shot for for one of the elephants, um, and then the trackers were just behind him on standby, and 
leave the rest of the group were sort of staying back because we didn't want to be in the way. Um, and then, um, yeah, once once the we were, it was great because this is this is little John, who was the first of the two brothers that were, that was collared. Uh, he went down very nicely, uh, lying on his side. And the first thing the vet does is make sure that uh, the heart rate and everything, breathing is fine. Make sure that the the trunk is, um, you know, the airways are clear. So um, use a little twig to to keep the the trunk open. Um, and then he puts a uh, thermometer uh, on the backside, so to then have someone monitoring the temperature and the heart rate of, of the elephant. So it's all done very, very carefully, and then that allows the vet then to uh, attach the collar around his neck. In this case, um, because he was a younger elephant and and still still going to grow, um, the vet made sure that there was a lot of uh, slack so that the elephant could can grow into the collar uh, and it, anyway we the elephant's going to be closely monitored um, and these collars will last a good few years so uh, and once if, if the collar survives that long they often break from elephants uh, rubbing themselves on trees or whatever so if it does survive we would then uh, remove them so um, so if it, if it did get too small but they usually do fall off and then here we've got uh, Big John, uh, who was his older brother, and we had uh, another moment where uh, I, thought, I told you before that they travelled uh, from from Guinea into Liberia, and we we chose June because uh, they'd previously moved into Liberia later in the year. But then, of course, this time he decided to move into Liberia just weeks before we arrived. Um, so then. Uh, it meant we we did choose another candidate. We tried to collar another candidate, uh, a lone bull, who was um, loves pineapples and was eating everyone's pineapples. But unfortunately, he was a bit more elusive uh, and nervous around uh, people, so it was very difficult for the vet to get a good shot. So after three days, or three or four days of long days trying to to track him, uh, we decided to. Uh, Send the team across to Liberia, which was also the first elephant, uh, forest elephant was collared. Um, so it was, I think it was a good opportunity for uh, the Guinean and Liberian authorities to to collaborate. Uh, there's a transboundary elephant uh, plan in place, and it was really smooth. Uh, everyone was able to cross the border with no problem. There's a few uh, members from the Liberian authorities there from Guinea, and um, there so. Big John, and that, that, that the locals are calling him Big John and, and Little John. Um, so, and here now, now that we've got the, the collars safely placed, um, on the left, I've included the previous uh, journey from, from the forest elephants, from the two brothers, and that was based on observations. Um, so, it, obviously, that requires a lot of manpower. Uh, and a lot of tracking and transport and, and very difficult. But now, as you can see on the right, you can simply log in and, and see the um, see the location of the elephants and track their movements. And at the moment, this this was taken uh, only today, and they're they're sort of within the protected area, which is nice because previously they've spent a lot of time in, in the secondary forest. Um, and farm areas, but there's actually more food availability for them in, in the secondary forest compared to the primary forest. So it's understandable why they're they're out there. Um, and then here you can see we, we've plotted the the movements of of Big John. Um, he's uh, we we call him uh, quite close to the Guinean border, and he's travelled quite far south into Liberia. And then you can see that he was straddling the the border with the Ivory Coast, um, and yeah, it was a bit worrying the Ivory Coast because uh, there was much more fear from the of the forest elephants there than in Liberia. Um, so we were concerned there would be a more conflict. Uh, but thankfully, he he then amazingly took the same exactly the same route that that he did last year. Uh, if you look at the the track on the left. Uh, compared to the, the this track, 
uh, it's pretty much identical. Um, and oh, it's interesting when, when the dots are close together, you can see that he's obviously feeding and taking his time, being quite relaxed. And then where where the dots are more spread out, I think at this time they were sending a signal every 12 hours. So you can see that when he's making a beeline back to back to Ziyama Forest, um, he's traveling quite quite a distance. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's a brief outline of the latest uh, project. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or oh, actually, uh, if you, I did have a video that I wanted to share um, of the little John after after he um after he woke up so one once the um once the collar's been fitted um the the vet then gives the the antidote to to wake up so we place the gopro on the um on the tree and it's actually very very quick so once the antidote's given uh you don't have much time to to get away um so we just sort of took a step back and we were sort of hiding in the forest before, but we had the GoPro take this nice footage. Christian, I think you need to switch which screen you're sharing. Oh, uh, sorry. No worries. Is it not? I, was, I, thought, I thought everyone was, was <laughs> watching that. Yeah, we're um, not Okay, let me just, uh, okay, I need to switch the screen, okay. Or which window, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So you can see with his trunk, he sort of he can smell that we've all been around. And yeah, interestingly, they. Um, sort of, they do feel. They obviously know that they've got a collar on now, so they do feel it. But um, I'm told from the vets and, and other people that have collared elephants that they they get used to it quite quickly, and uh, there's no there's no change in their in their behaviour. And you can see the you can see the um, transmitter nicely positioned at the top with the counterweight below. He's giving it a little feel there.
This is a really cool video, Christian. Can you talk about if uh, the process of when Big John woke up, if it was any different or do you, with, do you with any changes? Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't there for Big John's coloring. So, um, but I'm told from the vet that it was it was exactly the same. He was very relaxed. Both of them are very relaxed elephants. Um, and unfortunately, it was pouring with rain with uh, Big John, so uh, they they didn't hang around and they didn't manage to get footage of him like this waking up. Very cool. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll send this to you as well. Yeah. So um, while we're finishing up this video, something to that everyone should pay attention to, we are recording this talk. If you want to watch it again or get a replay link, make sure you put your email in the chat or you email Julie or myself, and we will make sure that you get a link to this so you can watch it and share it with your friends. Um, we already have questions in the chat. So if you wanna start answering them, that would be awesome. Uh, first we have how big or how much do Little John and Big John weigh respectively? Can't, I mean, you kind of have to guesstimate. It's not like you can get a true weight on them. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't know how much uh, they weigh exactly, but um, I, we did we did have the vet did have his his estimates. Um, I mean, I, I, I have to I'll have to ask him. He, he's got it in his vet report. Um, so if you just give me a bit of time. I can I can look into that and, and get back to you, but um, but yeah, I mean, big big John is is quite big, so I think he's on the upper the upper scale of close to uh, close to four tons. Wow, that's impressive. Um, so we have some questions about the rangers. Um, yeah, how do you find the people that you employ as rangers, or how how are they recruited? Are they from the local communities, local villages? Yeah, so the the rangers are all um, they're all employed by the the local forestry centre, so it's the the Santo Forestero in Zacapori, um, and a lot of them are ex-military. So they um, they yeah they when after the the civil wars um, and and wars. All previous wars, they they then transferred them into um, into conservation. So you do you um, they've got different experiences, but they are all from the local community, and many of them live in the villages around the forest. And um, they are often based at one ranger post within the village, and they're the main focal point with uh, the, the local community. So. They will attend local village meetings, and, and they're very much part of the community. Um, so yeah, they are very much, uh, and they they work with Fauna and Flora International. Um, are there uh, assisting them with with management and uh, planning patrols and things like that? Okay, and you you talked a lot about the sort of difficulties and challenges in the collaring and in the tracking to collar, but. How does that relate to the daily lives of these rangers that that you equipped so they can do longer patrols and things like that? Like, what kind of maybe talk us through what circumstances they work under, the sort of challenges they face? Because I think it's a concept very far removed to what those of us kind of sitting in apartments and houses experience yeah. on a daily basis. Well, I mean, firstly. Uh... I mean, the, the way the, the the villages that they live in don't have any electricity uh, apart from there's, there's very little. There's, there'll be like one or two shops that have electricity. So in that sense, if they want to charge their phones, there's usually central points where everyone goes to charge them. So um, they there's limited uh, flowing water there to get drinking water. You need to go to these water pumps that have been placed there by the by UNICEF, for example. Uh, and so, so the living conditions can, especially in some of the periphery areas of, of the villages, um, it's very difficult for them to get uh, any amenities. Um, and, and as I said, a lot of them do rely on 
uh, resources from the forest. So their family members will, uh, you know, be having to collect uh, wood, for example, or, or go out and do farming during the day. Um, so, so it's yeah, it's a very different life to, to living in apartments. Um, and then you know the rangers, if they're based in the ranger post, very basic. A lot of them sleep on the floor. Um, they don't have mattresses. Uh, they'll um, often share a room with goats or or sheep or their their livestock. Um, you know, there's no there's no supermarkets as such. So uh, it's all uh, you know using the animals that they have available to them. And uh, and in terms of patrolling the areas, um, you know, most of them travel around on, on motorbikes. Um, the the only paved road is through the, the middle of the town the rest it's very very tough roads um so when and it rains a lot so often uh trucks will be stuck uh supplies can't get through to the villages uh sometimes you know the last time we went to guinea you, the, the equipment was stuck for three days in a road block because a, a bus had completely blocked the area um so we actually had to go and collect the equipment ourselves um, and then in terms of the patrols, you know, they've got to cross rivers and uh, go through very thick forests, uh, very muddy. So the equipment gets worn down very quickly. Uh, and then if you if you camp out in the, in the now that they're using the tents and, and camping out in the forest, uh, the I'm told the level of bugs at, at night, uh, mosquitoes, uh, obviously malaria is a big risk for them as well. So um, yeah, they're, they're really dealing with all the elements there. Wow, that's incredible! What they go through in order to sort of, you know, protect wildlife for everyone. Um, someone in the chat asked if they have any life insurance. We're guessing you no. Know? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. No, um, but they, perhaps Fauna and Flora uh, have dealt with the issue, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, so some more questions about forest elephants uh, and different things like that. So someone said, um, they missed what you said about the hybrids between forests and savanna. So have you seen very many hybrids? Um, have you seen or do you know if hybrids reproduce? I think you, re you talked about that, but maybe you can yeah. reiterate. Yeah, no. So I have, I personally haven't seen any hybrids. Um, they, they, there are. There's arguments about whether the West African forest elephants, uh, whether there are hybrids there as well. They tend to happen on the fringes, so uh, they tend to occur on the sort of savanna grasslands or between the forest and savanna. Um, so there's a lot of them in, uh, mainly studied in sort of eastern Congo. Um, and so I haven't seen them myself, but I've read studies on them, and basically, uh, they they the the they haven't found that they found that the genetics do not transfer into the savanna population. So, um, but they do into the hybrids. So that suggests that the hybrids do not reproduce, uh, which are otherwise, if they did reproduce, we would find. Uh, genetic similarity between the, the forest and the savanna in those areas and you just don't that makes perfect sense uh the magic of dna testing right yeah yeah and um, also the the interesting thing is in those areas they've more recent studies are actually showing that although the forest elephants eat mainly fruit uh they have found that certain times of the year they do share they do eat quite a lot of grass in these areas as well which is very very interesting and, and I think because forest elephants, they've got the same social structure in terms of, um, you know, family groups and uh, matriarchs being the leader and males being solitary. Um, I think more more solitary than savanna males. Uh, but these, these forest clearings and uh, grasslands, which they use, are really important for their socializing. And, and meeting mates so so um, because while, while they're in the forest it's difficult for them to interact 
with each other. So I think these are opportunities for for males and females to to meet each other. Really interesting. Um, questions are pouring in. So why does it take forest elephant population so much longer than savannas to repopulate? Uh, is it access to each other? Is it the original population numbers, combination of both? Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't. I'm. I don't know the the full answer to that. There may be studies that uh, talk about it. I, I have read that. I think it's something to do with the fact that um, their their diet may be less nutrient rich, um, and that may affect reproduction. I also think it has something to do with the fact that yeah, they interact less. They have less opportunities to interact with each other. Savanna elephant herds are much larger, so therefore much greater opportunity to reproduce. Um, and obviously there, there, there are genetic factors at play there as well. Okay. So if I'll, 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 I'll look into that, it's an interesting point. Well, and I think that brings up one of the things about having a recently recognized species is that it, it points to a lot of the things that we're still learning, right? There's a lot of research still yet to be done. Um, yeah. Some people are asking, um, what are the unique challenges that there are in protecting and preserving forest elephants as compared to savanna cousins? Is it just habitat or are there other things? Uh, I think kind of dovetails in what you've already been talking about, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, forest elephants are generally located in, um, well, yeah, the habitat is, is the main thing, but it's much more difficult to study them. So. Uh, most of the studies that have been done have be been based on observations in grassland areas or forest clearings. So we know a lot less about forest elephants and savanna elephants, which obviously make it more difficult to create strategies that are effective. Um, but I also think they are based in areas where poach and uh, anti-poaching is, is uh, much more difficult because of the habitat as well so again it's a habitat challenge and um, also I think the areas the countries that they live in or some of the countries that they live in perhaps have less effective governance in place and studies have shown that where there's less effective governance and anti-poaching in place there's there's obviously more poaching uh, so I think some Mike studies have shown that in areas where there's less governance, there are more elephant carcasses uh, present. So, um, but you know, I think it varies from country to country. Countries like Gabon are, are very well equipped, um, and then other countries uh, may have less less governance, and therefore, and, and we and, be, and because it's we we might actually not know the extent to which uh, poaching is happening. And I think in northeast Gabon. Uh, you know, studies show I think uh, ninety percent of the population uh, went in, in, in the space of a decade in in one reserve. So, um, yeah, I think I think the habitat is, is probably the main the main reason. Also, the 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 tusks, uh, the ivory from forest elephants seems to be more valuable uh, than than that of savanna elephants. So. Um, that may be more attractive they can get more from the black market uh, and also i think nigeria is one of the main ports or lagos is one of the main ports uh, for for transporting illegal ivory why are the tusks more valuable for everyone at home well i believe they're denser uh denser ivory and also they've got a bit of a, a tinge a pinkish tinge uh, so there's a premium uh, on that. Interesting. Um, and also, sorry, just to add, also the uh, logging, uh, logging, logging plays a big role because um, previously it'd be very difficult for poachers. The same same way, it's difficult for rangers to access the forest. Difficult for poachers uh, until, but now that logging companies are being given uh, licenses to harvest timber uh, this creates roads so previously 
impenetrable areas are now easily accessed and unmonitored. Um, so it, 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 it's meant that poaching has, has increased dramatically in the last few decades. That's upsetting. So there's habitat loss, poaching, conflict. People are asking what the number one problem facing forest elephants is, especially in terms of long-term survival. And then as a corollary, what can we in the West do to help? Um, yeah, well, I think poaching is, is the main issue. Uh, poaching and habitat loss uh, and, for, and habitat fragmentation, I think there's there's no longer a connection between the Central African forest elephants and the West African forest elephants. I think around Benin there's a there's a break in, in, in the in the forest. So I mean that's interesting. I mean there are arguments, as I said, about West African populations being separate species and, and maybe now that they've been separated, um it will increase that chance of there being separate species. Uh, I went to a really interesting talk recently in London uh, with Ian Redmond. Uh, he was, and he was telling, well, he was talking about a really exciting project that they've got, which, which I think sounds like one of the best chances we've got for forest elephant conservation, where it's called Rebalance Earth. And uh, it was what I was talking about earlier that they were talking about tokenizing the carbon sequestration value of forest elements and then allowing companies to offset their unavoidable uh, emissions by purchasing these tokens uh, and these tokens will uh, you know represent the the five million uh, dollars worth of, of carbon services that they provide to us so the idea is that these tokens will be sold and, and raise huge amounts of money for uh, forest elephant conservation and protection of the Congo Basin, um, and I think I'm not I'm not sure whether it will be open to individuals, but it would be great if you could take a flight and then purchase one of these tokens and, and offset your emissions, and, and and then that money can be used to you know build schools, hospitals, and, and improve uh, the the lives of the many local community members. And then if poachers come along and say, you know, oh, we'll give you Two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars to poach uh, to get to poach these elephants for the ivory, they'll say no because these elephants are actually paying us a lot of money because they, uh, you know, the West are all p uh, offsetting their carbon, so we want to protect them. So, yeah, I think it will. It's, it, for me, it sounds like a really exciting project, and I think he's he's been at the at the COP twenty seven uh, talking about this. So, uh, but yeah, I think in the meantime, studies have shown that anti poaching efforts and good governance um, have slowed poaching a lot. So in areas where there wasn't anti-poaching, I think populations have decreased by 70%, whereas they've remained relatively stable. So I think it's really important to have the presence uh, on the ground. The other exciting project is elephant listening project. They, they've got recorders in the forest and, and uh, they're able to send record gunshots and and things like that in the forest and, and deploy the poachers. Uh, and what we're doing is in, in Guinea with, with the collaring, um, you know, monitoring, learning more about how they move and, and involving the local community, uh, educating them uh, about the importance of, of live, coexisting with the forest elephants. And, and and one of the things we're looking at in Guinea as well is, is um, creating posters and uh, about wildlife laws and uh, and distributing this amongst local people so they understand the consequences of, of poaching and, and maybe teaching them other ways of, um, of gaining livelihoods in a sustainable way with forest animals. That's a perfect segue into the next question. Someone was asking, what does community and farmer education look like? So you're just sort of touching into that a little bit. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I can't say I'm too familiar with the educational system in, in these areas, um, but they. Um, I mean, they, they they have a very good understanding. I think better than we do of of the of the forest and and, and different species and 
uh, how it all works, albeit not in, in maybe not in the same way that we learn it at university and things like that. Um, and but yeah, I, I I can't say what their level of education is. Like there are, from what I've seen, schools in the area, and I think nature is very much part of their curriculum. Um, yes. So so they, and and from my conversations with them, they 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 are passionate about elephants. And, and in Guinea, the the elephant is the the national uh, animal. And the community outreach must be helped by the fact that the rangers and the eco guards are coming from those villages and communities, right? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, yeah, there's we saw now the the excitement uh, that everyone had for 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 elephants, and uh, you know, we the vet was saying that he only wanted to have a few, uh, well, as, as few people as possible uh, on 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 the patrols to look for the, the elephants or the collaring. And there was so much excitement that we ended up lots and lots of people were just turning up and, and wanting to follow. So we, we, there was a bit of crowd management that we had to do. And, and I love, I love the idea. I love the fact that when, you know, whenever you go to a, to a village as an outsider and uh, you, you go and meet the, um, the heads of the community and introduce yourself and, and whenever you say that you're there to help with the elephants, everyone's very appreciative um, and, and really happy that, you know, people from all over the world are, are supporting what they do. Well, it's it's nice to hear that that's universal, that people, no matter where you are, love elephants, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't speak for every single community, <laughs> uh, but, but, but that, that's been my experience. Uh, and obviously there are there are some people who, who are very upset with um, with with the fact that their crops keep getting destroyed, and uh, you know we're asking how how we can how we can protect their their crops, and that that's the reality that um, you know if, if if they can't live a life if they can't make a living uh, and feed their families because the elephants are destroying it, they are not going to want to support the project to protect the elephants uh, and one thing i will say is you know outside in the secondary forest areas very little wildlife around i mean i think i saw one mongoose um, and the bird life generally was great but um you know there, there wasn't much left out there in the areas around around the villages but you know people people rely on on bush meat heavily to live right well it's a completely different way of life and that's why we have to have habitat patrols and all the different things that you guys are doing to maintain the populations uh we are coming up on an hour so we should probably wrap up do you have any sort of parting thoughts or things that you think we haven't covered that people should know um no i think just uh spread the word about how important forest elephants are for the whole planet and uh and yeah share as much as possible and and get people to to uh to talk about it absolutely uh, we have people in the chat already saying how they've learned things today that they didn't know even though they've studied elephants for a long time so that's great to know you you've made an impact just today yeah well, I'm glad. Um, I'll, yeah, and also, I mean, things, things that I want to look at are, you know, promoting forest elephant uh, tourism. Uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on people going on gorilla trekking, uh, but, you know, why we, people, people should go on holiday for forest elephant uh, trekking, for example. And, and there's great lodges um, in Central Africa that, that you can go to and, and so yeah, I think I think it would be great to get people into traveling to those areas as well and and seeing them. And, uh, tourism has done so much for conservation as well if it's done sustainably. Absolutely, sustainable and seeing an animal in person is a life changing experience, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I think you educated a lot of us everyone had a so much a great 
discussion, great conversation. Um, I think Debbie and Julie might want to say a couple more things, but we really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you so much, Christian. No, thanks. Thanks to to you guys for your support. Uh, those projects couldn't be done without without you guys. Julie, Debbie. Debbie, did you want to say anything? I was just going to thank Christian. I I am honored that IEF can support uh, the projects that you're involved with. Um, they're exciting. Uh, they, I know they make a difference. And and again, we're just honored that um, that you applied to us for funds and that we're able to support you. And I hope that we can continue doing so for years to come. I hope so. Thank you very much. Yes, and I echo that thought. Thank you very much. And if everybody would like to maybe turn their cameras on, if you feel comfortable, we'll just give Christian a nice round of applause and thank him for um, his wonderful work and everything that that he's doing. And that said, um, so if any of you, I know I see a lot of our donors are on here and some of you are already currently donating. And if you would like to make a donation to IEF to help support Christian's work, um, we would love for you to do that. Um, also, I'm, I did put something in the chat earlier. We did record this session. So if you would like to have um, a link to the recording of this, please email me. Uh, my email is in the chat. It's jbates at elephantconservation.org uh, for those of you who don't have it. And I'll be happy to send you a link to the video of this so you can um, share it with friends and family. Um, and that said, I think the next thing that we have coming up with IEF will be on Giving Tuesday. We have not put anything out um, publicized about this yet. But breaking we are the news planning today. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We are planning on having two sessions on Giving Tuesday. One will be at 10 a.m. Central Time, and the other one will be at 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and we'll have some more information that will come out through our um, e newsletter. Uh, we'll also have some information posted on our Facebook page about that. And if you are on my email list to get links and information for these conservation chats, you will get it there as well. So um, that's another good reason to email me if you want to be on the inside track of our conservation chats going forward. I do have an email list that I keep. Um, so I send out um, notices with dates and times and Zoom links for upcoming chats. So um, Great to see everybody today, and um, hopefully we'll see more people on uh, Giving Tuesday and see you back with us on, on those dates. So stay tuned for some more information on those sessions that we're going to be having. And we're going to have some very special guests on Giving Tuesday. So mm -hmm. both uh, sessions will uh, introduce you to uh, more people who have interesting stories and interesting information to share about elephants and conservation. Absolutely, thank you all for being here. We can't do our work without each and every one of you. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.